Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think I can make it. Greetings, Internet. Welcome to episode number 105 of the Comic Walker Show. We are live. I'm your host, Matt. With me, as always, are Nick and Mike, our very special guests this week, and a uh, friend of comic watchcom Steve Orlando. Uh, he's going to be talking to us tonight about Commanders and Crisis for Women, the pull from TKO, anything else you can maybe uh, pry out of them. Who knows? The night is young. But, uh, Steve, <laughs> thank you so much for showing up. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I think it's my first time on Comic Watch. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to talk to you guys. I'm excited you read the poll uh, just out on Monday. So you're, my, you're actually the first people to talk to me about that. And we can answer, as you said, uh, pretty much any damn thing you want as well. Sweet. I love that. Because I'll be honest, I could fill up the hour talking to you about Martian Manhunter, but I won't let <laughs> my co-host suffer through that. No, uh, I mean, we can do 20 minutes on Martian Manhunter. Ah, my man. Okay. You just got to be so, careful. Like, I like that book a lot. I don't want to, like, end up doing, like, a Jeffrey Tobin on, you know, just underneath <laughs> the screen. We can't talk about my work being good too much. Like, we have to, you have to denigrate me a little bit. But uh, but we'll get to Martian Manhunter. Most definitely, dude. Um, so, I got to tell you, uh, I, I read um, the poll. I read Commanders in Crisis. And I got to say... You're writing like like a man on fire, like a man liberated right now, and just all of the creative juices are flowing and and uh, doing whatever the hell he damn well pleases. So, uh, how are you feeling these days, man? I'm writing like a man who lives in Boston and has to pay rent. It's crazy. Uh, no, I mean it's uh, joking aside. This year has been, barring the numerous obvious uh, uh, issues that we're all facing, I've been. I've been su surprisingly lucky for someone with my track record at the casino. Uh, and like, it's been a really, I mean, I've been, we've, we've all had to hustle our asses off, but doing all these originals uh, and I've been mostly working on originals though. I I'm still a little bit of DC and a little bit of Marvel. Uh, it's funny. Like I'm writing three times as much. You would think I'd be three times as stressed, but I'm actually a third as stressed because it's all stuff that I own. It's all stuff. I mean, and it's all stuff that I know is going to stick with me going forward. Uh, and it, it's new, fresh ideas. Uh, and so, and then when I do go back to doing stuff, like you'll see, like I did this dark multiverse one shot that's out next month. Now it's November, right? Next month What is time. Uh, and then some other stuff that you'll see announced in Marvel, hopefully soon. Uh, I, I'm, I'm refreshed on that type of work, right? Cause I haven't been sticking just only doing work for hire for, for years and years. So, it's a great time. You know, I, I, I'm surprised. I was nervous when we did that article in the Hollywood Reporter in January. It was like, oh, I'm going freelance. And I was like, ha ha, let's fake it for the world. Uh, <laughs> but, but now that we're out and we've done it for a while, uh, it, it's really been really rewarding. And it turns out that what my longtime mentor told me years ago, as usual, was right. And, uh, you know, we have to start doing originals and, and, and we come to appreciate a lot more once we've been inside the system. So the system is beautiful. It led to things like Martian Manhunter, Batman Shadow and, and stuff like that. My first run on Wonder Woman. Uh, but once you've in, once you're in, it's nice to be able to break out and build your own stuff from scratch. Yeah, I can, I can get behind that. Uh, fewer corporate cogs or what have you to deal with? Well, and, and, and I should be clear, like I've said this in a lot of podcasts, it's not even like, oh, corporate cogs, like there's a different set of rules working for a billion dollar character that's 80 years old. Uh, and, and there should be, you know, like we learned very quickly on Milk Wars, like you can't have Wonder Woman holding dildos. Uh, and, you know, that makes sense. So... And, you know, I respect that. I, I, I should. And, and, and that's a ludicrous example that is real. But also it, 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 there's many examples below that that are less crass that are just part of the gig when you're working on these major, major characters sure. that appear. But it, it's and, and ultimately, like, I look at that as a challenge, like the, working within that framework is a challenge uh, that I love. But also sometimes it's nice to just cut loose and, and, and not have to do that and build for, again, build. You're the one setting the groundwork, and, and that's what doing these originals is like. 
Dude, that's awesome. Um, that is, so by the way, true about Wonder Woman. We found that out in the uh, the Shade the Changing Girl, God Love Cecil, and uh, and Mirka. Like we found out exactly where the line was uh, between Shade the Changing Girl and Wonder Woman. And I totally respect and understand that. But you only find out where the line is by trying to cross it. So hey, you sometimes go. you gotta go there, man. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it goes. But um, so you got you got the poll that just came out from TKO. And by the way, congratulations. Um, they're, they seem like they're really picky about who they work with. Maybe picky is not the right word, but uh, they, they've got a very high caliber the, uh, uh, that they choose. And I think that's because of the format that they've chosen to go with for their, their story rollout. So, you know, seeing your name there among Steve Niles and, uh, you know, Garth Ennis and this very select crop of artistic talent and writerly talent. Uh, that, that's awesome. I mean, to me, that's great. What has it been like for you working with TKO? I mean, they're, it's really exciting. Uh, they, as a company, really empower you to do the best, biggest version of your story. And, and I really like that. You know, we the, the poll is something we had pitched elsewhere, to be honest. And I think the scale was intimidating to some folks or it just wasn't what they do, which is also fine. Uh, but when we came to them, like they immediately saw the potential in it. And when I gave them my blue sky ideas of who to work with, because I've been wanting to work with Ricardo for a long time, you know, they didn't balk uh, at making sure that it was a book he could do and, and wouldn't have to, you know, that wouldn't have to compete with his time uh, for with work for other companies. He was coming off these huge Miller books um the hit girl series is what i mean and then also deadpool versus black panther or marvel uh and like he was a get and ricardo's an incredible collaborator and and they made that happen we were friends but you got a line you, know, you gotta you sometimes it takes help uh from a publisher to line everything up so you can make a book so they've been fearless and incredibly supportive and you know the poll especially is unlike any other book i've ever done i've never done something with a manga influence yeah uh, i've never gotten to do the sort of like hard sci-fi not really like most of my book tends to be angry people punching other people in the face uh and again like that happens numerous times in the poll but it still tastes like orlando but it's it's, it's got a new it, it's got a new overtone to it i guess no it's definitely different from anything else of yours that i've read and i mean the the obvious uh manga influence in the art only lends to that sense so um when you were kind of crafting up the main story for the poll, was that the look you had in mind or? Uh, it, went kind of couple, it went through a couple variations, uh, but only one at TKO. Like I had pitched it years ago to Image with my collaborator, Artyom Trakadov from Undertow. Uh, and at that point, obviously it looked a lot different because he was drawing it. And it just sort of went dormant because he went on to do... Uh, the hell was it turncoat uh at boom which god who was it might have even been alec packnadel wrote that uh who's now in wave three with me but comics historians will have to go and confirm uh could have been ollie masters as well i'm just because clearly all english writers are the same to me and i'm an asshole um you damn but, american <laughs> yes you uh, bet <laughs> uh, but once we knew that Ricardo was coming on, like, and that was a possibility, that was really the only way we could see it. And the story changed around him, you know, the type of set pieces and the type of story. And that's how it should be when you're being collaborative. Uh, it, it evolved once you knew he was on board, things got bigger. The scale got bigger. I don't think you would have seen the moon cracking in half in our Holmes book. It was a little more street level, dirty sci-fi. Like it was Blade Runner, not Fifth Element. Uh, and, and, and when Ricardo came on we were like, no, we got to get, we got to blow the doors off, uh, with these double page splashes and things like that. A lot of the scale from the book came from knowing he was on board and we could go to those places. Awesome. Uh, Nick, why don't you go for it? Yeah, I guess I'd kind of have to start off. Are the shirtless variants for Commanders in Crisis still available or is that well, something if, that... <laughs> if you guys make a... An issue sell over 60,000 units, even though issue one only sold 50,000 units. It's always available. That's a standing offer. Issue seven. Now, sold. hold on. Some of us don't know what the shirtless variants are. I'm going to need a little uh, insight there. 
Well, you know, like it's hard to get noticed. Everybody just does the same thing in comics these days. I'm for the most part, you know, uh, and with the launch of Commanders in Crisis, you know, I, I get enough ribbing online from like Tom King and other people who do like one picture of a day and, and call it done uh, for taking my shirt off on Instagram and things. I was like, fuck it, you know, like if, if the book sells, well, actually it was if the book sells 40,000 units, I will take the piss out of myself and I will do a Twitter poll and I will be on the cover and you can pick what idiot outfit I'm wearing. Um, and then if it's 60 grand uh, <laughs> units, uh, I will take my shirt off and do like a thirst trap variant. And at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, like it's about, you can't take yourself too seriously. And I never have clearly look at me. Uh, and you know, we we have sold over fifty thousand units. I made good on my word. Uh, the the I believe with issue three, uh, you're going to be able to buy the Twitter approved Canadian tuxedo variant, which is a photo variant of me wearing all denim and reading a copy of issue one. Uh, and you can buy it. I said I would do it. If there's one thing about me on my independent books, if I say I'm going to do it, I will do it. So you know, I, I have happens. to say. That that is some uh, fraction in Vidarsky level surreality <laughs> you've achieved there, sir. <laughs> I'm probably, well, I would I would love to be. I was really angry that Fraction did like an ASMR video with like one of the one of Kelly Sue's Aquaman comps because that's definitely an idea that I would do. Uh, and and he fucking stole it. Uh, but but uh, yeah, so. You know, if if by chance, like issue seven or any, I, I don't know why I say seven, any future issue breaks 60K, I'll take my shirt off. I don't give a shit. I'd throw a party and so would my production partners. So, uh, you know, but I, I, I don't know if that's the direction books tend to go these days. That said, I was very happy the launch was overwhelming to launch over 50,000. That's higher than... It's higher than Martian Manhunter launch. So like I, I uh, you know, I, I'm very excited by that. I was happy to do the, uh, the, I was happy to do the Canadian tuxedo variant. I must admit it was not the option of four that I personally was hoping for. Uh, when it came to the Twitter poll, there's an option of me to wear a onesie and be reading infinite jest. And <laughs> That's the one I wanted people to pick. And then after that, there was, I called it lobster helmet, but what I was going to do was wear my dog's lobster costume on my head. Uh, Cause I have a corgi. Okay. So it's like it's the right one size for my head. Yeah. Um, and then there was an option where I would wear a Dio shirt because personally, something you know about me can't stand Ronnie James Dio. Sorry, Dio fans. <laughs> not my thing. But you know what? There's a lot of things I don't like that other people do, and that's fine. I'm not a person that has to have you not like it if I don't like it. And probably if I didn't constantly have a friend in high school torturing me with Rainbow in the Dark, I would feel differently. But I spent years – I gave the short version of this online. But, yeah, like between my four years of high school – it was the it was like the mixtape era because I'm 35, and, I, and they, he would always drop fucking Rainbow in the Dark in as a ghost track, so it would just sneak up on me out of nowhere. And I just it's at this point like it's like you know the trigger scent that X23 has like I hear that and I just want to fucking commit a brutality. So like, <laughs> but if that didn't happen, I probably would be more. Uh, I understand the significance. Uh, and historic nature of Dio, but it's just you know, I can't do it. So I got you. Well, no, <laughs> anyway. I, I, I think it was when you were you were uh, floating the idea of the shirtless co covers on Twitter, which I utterly forgot was the genesis of this until you brought it up. But <laughs> I was I was telling you, and you probably probably have no idea it was me you were talking to at the time, but uh, that I was going to send you a shirt when it came out. And I totally biffed on it because you were like, yeah, send it care of the image and with my, you know, to their offices. And I just, I totally blank. So you're going to get a cool comic watch shirt from us mailed to you at image as our way of saying congrats on commanders in crisis. Thank you. Well, you know, if you buy 60,000 units, I'll wear that on the cover. So I'm not going <laughs> to buy 60,000. I can't make that. Kind of All right. Um, but yeah, those are good it's, promotions, though. I mean, that's an investment, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. I suppose we can all go in a few bucks, right? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> no, but really, seriously, we 
just got done talking about Commanders in Crisis kind of before we hopped on the show, and I think we're all really hyped about it. And it's an exciting book, and it feels kind of like you're not restrained by anything, and you're able to take on such a large-scale concept with it. Um, is it daunting to do such a task like that, or did you kind of feel up to it and ready to go? I mean, it's free. It's freeing in some ways because there's a lot of steam being blown off from four years of like, oh, the Justice League can't do that. Oh, like, oh, yeah, that character can't do that. And like, again, I understand, but it's also nice to not have those rules. So um, my hope is that I don't just completely go off into like go so far into my own mania that, it, that, that the story continues, which I, I'm confident it will because I know how to outline a thing. But no, it's very pleasing to be able to just like have an idea and do it for lack of a better phrase like because comics is relatively fast as well so you know you there's stuff that's going to come out and it, it's crazy me it feels like i just wrote it because i'm leaving t room any tissue for sort of like i'm leaving short scenes where i can put new fresh ideas in uh and yeah like so far so good obviously talk to me after issue 12 but it's nice. It's nice to just be able to go and push these big ideas out there um, or small ones at the same time, you know, like uh, it's, it, it, but new in either scenario. Um, I mean, I have a, <laughs> I think in issue three, I have villains called the social callers, which have been in my head since I read Enigma, the uh, Milligan and Figredo book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In that book, there's like a one-off scene where one of the villains, group of villains is called the Interior League. And their whole gimmick is that they rearrange your furniture in a way that drives you insane. <laughs> and I've always loved that. So I created the social callers, which is which are these beings that inhabit your phone and you use your notifications to similarly turn you into a murderous psychopath. <laughs> uh, to the point where you begin to protect your phone like it's like your wounded young. Uh, and so, you know, like that's not worth a whole story, but it's a thing that I loved and it's an homage to like a sort of raw creative moment in Enigma that I've stuck with me for 15 years. And, and, and you know, I thought of it now it's in there. Uh, <laughs> and they're on the, and they got a weird design too. They have an old Alexander Graham Bell uh, telephone for like a cod piece. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love these wild ideas that you bring to the story. I mean, even in the pool, the the sexual euthanasia that you get to yes. pretty quickly in the story, it doesn't feel like something that you can just do at DC or or Marvel. And that felt I, like that felt like some <laughs> dirty mid nineties vertigo happening right there. You know. <laughs> yeah. but, Ah, oh, I'm not supposed to be reading this. Oh. This is fantastic. You, <laughs> can, <laughs> you can thank my actually my my vampires and literature professor from college who was obsessed with this idea that like sex and death are like a crossroads. So I mean it's been in my mind for a while. But yeah, no, I mean it's nice to be and big finish, obviously. Not that I'm gonna suck my own cock here, but I think it's a fun <laughs> name. So um, oh, definitely. <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, again, and, 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 and Ricardo was so on board for that. Like, I remember when we were, this is stupid, but I'm stupid. Like, when when we were planning the book is when the show, we were in progress, but I was just writing the first issue is when the show Euphoria started, which I loved on HBO Max. And at the time, there was like this press release about issue one or HBO about how lewd it was and it, where HBO was like, there's no more than 30 penises in this, in this, <laughs> in this episode. So I texted Ricardo. I was like, we need to put 31 fucking penises in this book. Uh, just not principle. Uh, and we tried. You know, I don't know if we achieved it, but but Ricardo is fearless. Uh, he's not he's not like, he's not like Adam Hughes saying how scarred he was having to draw Dr. Manhattan's dick for four issues. So, <laughs> uh, Scoop, go ahead. Oh, this is great. Plus, do other people that give you this content? Well, well. <laughs> <laughs> Come back anytime, by the way. We were a PG-13 okay. show, yeah. damn it. <laughs> no. Oh, well, you should have told me that beforehand. Uh, I'm sorry. Fortunately, yeah. I... Uh, have no no problems, no problems. <laughs> I can't. I, I mean, I'm from Central New York, but I can control my swearing if I know beforehand. However, the horse yeah. is out of date now, so I just yeah. say keep going, keep going. I, I, I think a few episodes back on number 100, like the first word out of my mouth was "fuck." 
So, so I mean, don't, so, you don't know, have gear or how we're taking on, basically. More or less. <laughs> I remember when I was like first starting to break into comics, which was when I was 12. So 1997. Uh, we were at, my, at that time, my mom would go with me to cons because, again, I was 12 and you were to fly across the country to San Diego. And in this, in this case, from Syracuse, this is there's a point to this. And uh, Chaikin was there. And I mean, I knew he was there, but I didn't run into him. And but what, what we would do, because my mom was great, is that when I was going around trying to quote unquote network at age 12, she would also stand in line at booths and get me sketches and things like that. Great mom. And I came back and she said, well, I met this, uh, you know, I met this very nice man from New York uh, who grew up like in the neighborhood near me and all these things. And he was super nice. And he said he did X, Y, and Z books uh, and very, very nice man, but filthy, filthy, filthy mouth. Uh, and I, when I thought about the book, she said it was definitely Chaikin. <laughs> Uh, you know, and later as a, as a professional, I told him this story and he, uh, and he didn't, he just confirmed that it was, it, that it probably was him <laughs> all, all odds betting based on that story. Um, but so he would swear a lot, but and have some wild takes, but I will try to rein it in. Um, that said, it's very hard for me. I'm doing a young adult fantasy book, uh, that hasn't been announced yet. And I have got a co-writer on it because I realized very quickly that, uh, I need someone to remind me of what you can and can't do in, in a young adult book. Uh, Aftershock next year, but. Awesome, dude. It actually is gorgeous. Like it is on the topic of me never doing anything that is similar to other things I've done for the most part when I can. Uh, totally different. Like if, if, if you, me, the guy that likes at, like angry people, uh, having sex or killing each other. Uh, this is a book about like getting a second, one last adventure with your pet after they pass over the rainbow bridge, uh, oh, wow. be more different from things I've done before. So I am excited and I probably already said too much, but I'm not going to say more, but that'll be announced pretty soon. Okay. You didn't hear it here first. Nope. <laughs> Wink. Mike, go ahead, buddy. Yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, dealing with um, the different uh, <clears throat> storylines and issues with uh, Commanders of Christ issue one, um, you have stuff like the American Individu uh, uh, Individuality Act um, and the 52 individual nation states. When you were first outlining the story, were you drawn to, say, like current events without maybe speaking about the current events? Or was this something that you had in the pocket for a while? Well, two different answers. Uh, the 52 states is just because I love like baseline alternate history and to think how it would make things different. Um, and it's my book. So I was, you know, like, let's, let's do this. Um, I'm also fascinated. So Puerto Rico is one of the states. And then the 52nd state is Sicily. Uh, and that has always been of interest to me because there was a hot minute in the mid to last century that Sicily almost did become independent mm -hmm. from Italy and petitioned to be a state in the middle of Europe, which like the, the, the way that that, if that had played out is really, really interesting to me. And it actually the, the guy that tried to do that was, uh, in a novel by Mario Puzo called The Sicilian, which is probably a pretty good novel, and it's a very bad movie starring one of my favorite actors, Christopher Lambert, playing an Italian guy. <laughs> um, same accent, same chuckle. He's a gem. But anyway, so that was more just because I like just having like baseline things. Like, I like setting the rules of the world where you just say that one, you have like a couple givens, you know, like I like that Looper is like, for example, like the, the TK and Looper is just there. It's just like a, you, you, you're in, in the world and this is a thing. It's not necessarily what the story is about, but it's, it's some seasoning to show you that the world is different. Um, the individuality act, like, I mean, it's impossible to say that it's not influenced by current events because no creator is not influenced by current events ever, like without being like a weird cop out. Like you may not be writing about what's going on, but it's on your mind. But that mm -hmm. it also goes back to this, like the the agree to disagree in, in, in America adage and the like sort of like, in my opinion, like logical error of the concept of like, well, you know, you're not tolerant of my intolerance. 
Uh, and, you know, so, which has been long before this current era, that sort of concept. So it's certainly like, I think that we are, the, the tensions are clearly higher than ever before, but I think there would have been something there. Would I have been writing about the death of empathy in a different era? I don't know. I mean, I can't say that, but the ideas didn't start in, well, in 2016, they certainly, yeah. there was gasoline on the fire, but they didn't start then. And I don't know, I mean, I think that we have a hard time caring about each other. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we need to, so so I don't know. You know, the, the idea has been on my mind for a while, uh, but you know, in, in an alternate universe where things went differently in the past, well, four years, who knows if it would have come up immediately, but it would have been on my mind, you know? So, so uh, I guess that's the answer. Yeah. Uh, in the individuality act, like, again, like, it feels, <laughs> it feels both like something that could happen, but also like it's a complete abdication of responsibility. So uh, it's the antithesis to me of everything that we should be doing. Uh, and so why not make it, uh, why not make it this big threat? But also, you know, we'll see how it wraps up. I think I broadly know what happens at the end, but to be honest, I'm leaving a little liquid because who knows what the world's going to look like, uh, sure. when I'm writing that issue. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> who knows if the, we'll have a country. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if I want to write what is essentially a fairy tale of us all deciding we can get along if we really can't. Uh, but I, I broadly know what happens and, and what I want to say about, about empathy and power and things like that. Yeah. Now speaking on, um, empathy, like would say like prize fighters abilities, um, was his abilities kind of built out of that and only as strong as the people want him to be? Was that kind of an extension of this? Um, it's, it's, an, it's, it's I want to sort of dissect what like caring and empathy is and isn't, you know, like, cause it makes you, once people know it's gone, you know, like prize fighter, for example, mm -hmm. will like someone will, people will still do like his, his the person he's on and off with will right. still do nice things for him or say that he cares. And then it's the question of, well, but if this concept is dead, like, are you just doing it out of self-interest? Like other things are still around. So we want to pick that apart. And also on a practical level, prize fighter to me is an inversion of gladiator uh, from the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've just always thought that's clever and interesting. So, you know, I want to be able to pick that apart in my own way. A lot of these characters have DNA in, in, in abilities or character traits that I've always thought are interesting. But again, I'd like to have an open canvas to work with them. Right. You know, I mean, originator is a little bit black bolt and she's a little bit Jesse Custer, mm -hmm. uh, preacher. And she's a bit Chimera from Bloodlines, if you want to be like a huge, huge nerd like me. Uh, and and every, and, and a couple others in between. And they're all like that, you know, like Frontier is obviously like an Adam Strange and an Iron Man type, but her mm -hmm. abilities come from uh, an intuition that's more like Forge. Mm -hmm. Like she can invent things, but doesn't necessarily know how she's doing it. It's intuitive. And so there's, and I've always found that really fascinating. Um, in a way that people haven't really dug into, though I love Forge. If I ever write X-Men, he would definitely be on that team. Uh, but I think there's a lot more you can do there. And that goes for all the characters. You know, they all have something that I think is fascinating and on, hasn't really been approached in the way that I think I can uh, in other series. Right. right on. Well, what, one of the things that really did uh, catch my attention with Commanders in Crisis, number one, is just how unique all of the various characters' powers are. You know, I mean, typically you've got, okay, here's your token strong guy. Here's your badass fighter. Here's the stretch, you know, just stereotypical stuff you've seen a million times. But I don't think I've ever seen anybody with a power quite like originators. Um, and I mean, even Sawbones, like, kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, uh, Dr. Midnight, the modern Dr. Midnight. Um, but very different because he's not actually a surgeon for one thing. Uh, how in the world did you come up with some of these characters and their powers? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of it, I mean, on one hand, I keep an idea board. Uh, it's behind me. You can't see it because there's spoilers on it. But, um, you know, so it's not as though I whip these up and or any of the concepts from Commanders of Crisis up 
uh, in like two or three months. Like it's stuff that I've been brewing and cooking basically for my entire time at DC uh, when I was on contract there. And, and I've sort of put it together, deciding that my non big two superhero work was all going to be in this new universe now. And even if Commanders in Crisis doesn't blow the doors off, uh, low key will be building in this world, you know, just like a Marvel ADC. If a book gets canceled, new things are still in that universe. We're still building a, a new tapestry. So I've wanted to do that for a while. Uh, but when it comes to the powers themselves, to me, it's all about the, it, it's cool to have people that are super, super powerful, but the characters we like the most always have some sort of uh, Achilles heel when it comes to those things. And it was important to me that we have characters that are powerful, but endearing because they're not, they have a vulnerability and that to me is like the black bolt model, right? Like, like, which I, I mean, there's a reason he's one of my favorite Marvel characters. He has this incredible, incredible power, but this incredible, incredible price he has to pay as well. Uh, and, and that doesn't play out the same for every character, of course, but it was important to me that there was a balance there. Yes. Like Sawbones can see inside, but he's a musician, not a surgeon. So he's basically like lear uh, learning from scratch to actually be able how to use his powers. You know, right. Seer is like Dr. Manhattan, but it's so exhausting and overwhelming for her uh, that it's only for a minute at a time. Uh, Originator, as you've seen, like she can basically do anything, but she knows how dangerous that is. So her first change she makes is to make sure her own powers uh, can only be for a day at a time uh, and so on and so forth. Awesome, dude. Uh, Nick, go ahead. Definitely. I think it plays into a lot of the use of genre that you've done in Commanders in Crisis. I seem to be drawn towards the sci-fi genre, but I can't help but notice the the inclusion of the vampire. And I need that horror to, to really fall in love with things. And I love that we kind of get right into well, it. Well, you don't we <laughs> well, it appears that there's a vampire, but I but stay tuned, I guess is what I would say. Uh <laughs> but, um I do like bouncing around genres and I like just like, I like being able to elude what's nice about comics, especially is you can allude to huge amounts of story, at least in my mind, uh, I, in a way that it's very utilitarian and very clean, uh, you know? So yeah, like I offhandedly threw out that the, you know, the, the police have a truce with vampires in Philadelphia. And and there and that's a whole story there and uh, and when we get to get into it, <laughs> uh, we'll see. But I love being able to do that, and that's the thing I took from like Morrison comics. Um, when I read a thing like Flexman Flexman Tallow, and there's allusions to all of these books that to be quite, I mean, obviously never came out uh, in these events that didn't happen, but it, it builds this bigger world. Uh, and especially if we be able to spin off these characters into their own series, I want to push further into genre. Uh, you know, like that would be ideal. Um, and there's more to come. You know, you'll see I have there's a Doom Patrol type team that we allude to in the world. There's a lot in the world. There's the, I mean, the Trinity in this world, you're you'll see before the end of the 12 issues. And it's and, and they're all to me. I think spun really, really, hopefully very interestingly. Um, you know, I'm especially proud of our, our, our first superhero that we will meet. I think they they first show up, they're alluded to in three and I think they show up in four and five, but like the, in like canonically, like our Crimson Adventure types, I'm very excited about them. But uh, we hope, as I said, that if we can keep going and, and keep doing uh, a lot of different types of books in this world, you know, uh, obviously, I mean, Constantine exists in the same world that Captain Carrot, uh, well, the same multiverse as Captain Carrot, I should say, Constantine exists in the same world that Captain Marvel does, Shazam, sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, both, of, they all work. So the hope is that we can build things that a lot of these different genres can live in. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel like there's a, a really intense horror story that could work in this world as a spinoff or maybe a continuation? Oh, I mean, yes. And it depends what kind. If we ever get to do a book with our Doom type characters, like, uh, I mean, that's your weird, scary art book. I mean, I, I love... I love Grant's run. I love Jared, uh, excuse me. I love Rachel Pollock's run. Uh, obviously I love Gerard's run. I wrote some of it with him. Uh, and so like there's, and, but it all depends on, on where we want to go. I mean, there's a story about 
that underworld with the police and things like that so that is alluded to just in a panel you know there's so much you can dig into and it's gonna and more is gonna come uh especially the the modern version of our original superhero who's madame fury um she can definitely exist in that world uh i mean she is our sort of batman type character in the present in the past she's more of a green hornet uh that version i mean the golden age version of her is more like a green hornet and Cato type thing though we have a spin that i'm very proud of uh so yeah without question and 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 that legacy that we established in in the 30s like where she starts you can explore everything in between too i had a book i want to do at dc called the bronze age which is going to be like the, the tree you know, the, the second sequel to new frontier and the golden age if you accept that those like thematic things and it never worked out but i could also tell that story in the 70s with these characters so and it was you know like and, and all those things, now that I we are building our own universe, they're all on the table. I write things down, and uh, I just gestured to my board that people can't see. I know it's useless, but, like, that's the nice thing, again, of just being out and doing originals. Like, you, the, we can we can tag stuff up as we, as, we, as we get to the end of the series, and just the names, I hope, are evocative enough that we can dig into them all. Um, and, you know, some may happen, some may not, but I have a lot of ideas and a lot of plans. And I'm not that old, so hopefully we have time. <laughs> yes. Mike? Nice. Yeah, Steve, um, talking about the universe building and just a unique story that is Commanders in a Crisis, because um, – nothing on the shelves right now reads like commanders in crisis. And that's one of the things that makes this book really, really great. Um, did you know that you wanted to do commanders in crisis on as creator owned and keep it with image or possibly maybe go Kickstarter just so you could have that, that ultimate control with the universe building and maybe separated characters, giving characters. Uh, well, series well and such. I mean, when I had the opportunity to do with image, I was excited because I haven't been there since 2015, you know, it was nice to go back after being uh, DC for so long. Um, I don't know about crowdfunding. I mean, to be to be fair, we like, we, we wanted an image. We got it an image. So got it. Huh? Jesus Christ. Got <laughs> that image. Uh, so I didn't really have to, have backup plans, which is lucky, uh, you know, but we're proud of the book. So sure, sure. Uh, they will take that. But uh, I will say this, like doing a Kickstarter in 2015, like I think my internal age is five years older than my, than my chronological age due to that. So I don't know <laughs> uh, if I'm ever going to be ready to do another one. And also it's nice to have that space for, for up and coming folks and, and other sure. privileged creators. So I'm not averse to it, but in this, it, it didn't cross my mind. And honestly, like I have such respect for folks like that do that because it is, it is a hustle. It is a, it is a, it's beyond a hustle uh you know and to, to to do all that yourself and i've done it i have friends i mean my friend mike kingston who does headlocked which is a pro wrestling comic uh, he does one every year and i am just i'm shocked that his heart hasn't exploded yet um it's a ton of work but uh i have immense as i said respect for the folks that for the folks that get it so uh, but I was lucky, as I said, you know, we're, we're, I, to, to meet up. Uh, I had an ongoing relationship with my co-creators on it, Studio Arancia, Mirka and Dolfo Studio. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because mm -hmm. um, I was doing a lot of localizations for them. And I finally, after like two years of doing that, said, you know, why don't we actually do something from scratch instead of me helping you with translations, which I still do, but I'd like to do some originals. And that's how this book came about. And, 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 mm -hmm. and they landed it where we wanted to land it. So in that respect, you've been very lucky. Uh, and hopefully we have more coming out uh, with those folks as well. I have uh, <laughs> a couple things that I'd like to to do as well. But it's right now the focus is on making this as good as it possibly can be for well for all twelve issues. I'm not even going to say for as long as it can be. I'd rather do twelve great issues, take mm -hmm. a break, come back with another like event homage book down the line, uh, and maybe some other spinoffs. But um, we want to deliver a killer a killer year of comics basically. And that's my goal right now. Yeah. Let's definitely start off on the, uh, on the right foot. Cause issue one is just, uh, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. And if we can get a prize fighter, uh, mini series, that would be uh, great as well, by the way. I, well, yeah, I mean, if I spun off, 
obviously that would be on my mind. Uh, I've never done queer superheroes outside of a corporate setting. I've done queer books outside of a corporate setting. Not that it would have been much different. It's not gonna be like, oh, asses everywhere. But like, it would be nice to, to be able to push some buttons. Yeah. I mean, there is, I mean, there is ass eating in Commanders in Crisis, but it's with a straight couple because I'm progressive, so. <laughs> well, there's definitely that moment in there where uh, prize fighter steals a kiss from the, from the firefighter. And it's like, who's got a problem with it? Huh? You know, I, that, that good in your face stuff that I don't foresee you having been able to uh, get away with it at one of the more corporate. But, well, um, I, mean, I should say this. We, they were, I've always, I've had nothing but support for like the stuff we did in Midnighter, the bisexual stuff in Martian Manhunter, which I'm especially proud of being by myself. Like it, it's rare that you get to talk about those things. So, I mean, they were incredibly supportive. I don't want to, first of all, I know other people have different had experience, had different experiences. So I'm not, countermanding those but my own experience is very lucky and and we never had any issues with the type of content we wanted to do other than of course the same issues people doing hetero content would be doing because of your content rating overall right you know, like it's not like i could just show like like midnight or like riding high on a dick uh but i but i you could you i couldn't show that with green arrow and black canary and that was always our standard like is this a thing that is because of the general content rating uh, or is it a this thing because of the fact that it's 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 queer content and luckily we we never ran into the latter and if anything it was always the former but that's just the way it goes you know uh, you know when you have a book that is a T plus and not mature readers book makes sense so uh, lo looking at the setup for Commanders in Crisis not the characters or anything like that but uh, this the general set up itself that this is the last world in the multiverse you know this book feels like it could have existed at one point in time at 1987 dc you know swap your characters out for the big three and i don't know aquaman or something but um that really caught my attention because you know at dc or even marvel to a lesser extent but they these big events they happen they we they the characters talk about them it's the end of the world it's the latest crisis and then it's over and we move on and you know yeah there's some fallout but not really but commanders in crisis seems to be tailored to the idea of oh shit the world will fall to pieces if everybody realizes there's no back door to this there's no way this is the last earth well, um, you're, well you're right and that, that is one thing I'll say. One of the nice things about uh, doing stuff that I own is that, you know, the world is not, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that, like, it doesn't end with everybody dying because I just, you know, <laughs> if I did that, get let me say it this way. If I did that, it would be for a reason. But the world isn't going to be the same. There's no need for us to do the status quo in a book that I own uh, and look like that. And that is one of the nice things about branching out because that is those types of fundamental changes. I think you can make a big statement by showing that they're needed. Look at the, it's rare that you can do that at a big company. And when you do, it stands out so beautifully. Look at the foundational changes that happen with like house of X and powers of 10, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, it'll probably take time for them to be for it to echo out in other books. Like hypothetically, like cancer is done. Diseases are done in the Marvel universe or whatever, you know, all the things that professor Xavier occurred cured to buy off the Krakoa and things like that. Um, but it's hard to coordinate. It's hard to do. And, and in a book that you own yourself, like you can make a fundamental change. So I mean, everything is on the table you know, in command right. like this. Maybe I will dissolve the United States at the end. But if I do, it'll be because it's what's needed uh, to rekindle uh, <laughs> hope uh, for the future. Like it won't just be arbitrary. It won't be for shock value. If I kill the very right. concept of, uh, you know, a, a federation of states, then it's going to be for a reason. And it's not just going to be because we want to, I don't know, rip Arsenal's arm off or something or make them, make them sell a cat for smack or whatever the hell happened to that storyline. Um, is it, we sell I don't think James smack? Robinson knows what happened in that story. There was, <laughs> there was, there was heroin involved and a cat 
Yeah. The cat. I didn't read it. Uh, but, but it, it, you know, it was setting that threshold right at the start creates an immediate sense of urgency and investment and, and, and impending doom because, you know, the other shoes got to drop at some point because now you've put it out there. It's Chekhov's gun. Right. So uh, immediately I'm, I'm, you know, my wheels are spinning as to how does how does he handle this? How do, do our heroes get out of this predicament? You know and I mean? To me, that's that's a mark of craft. That's a mark of someone that's really thought this through and ha clearly has something to say. And I mean, the death of hope right there at the beginning raises us just a little closer to that bar. Well, so. and, and I appreciate it. And one of the things we want to do, and it's, I can't talk about it too much because it upends some of the reveals in the book. But one of the things we want to do is pick apart uh, very common and accepted comic book tropes. One that is not a spoiler uh per se uh is that like you know every time people deal with the multiverse and you're just seeing inside my brain right now we're focused on ourselves because we're alive right now and we think we're important um and every time you for the most part you see books deal with the multiverse it's always like oh it's a mere reflection of the present moment but why uh you know we again think that because we're alive and we want to matter but there's no reason that these worlds wouldn't have diverged hundreds of years ago or wouldn't also be exactly like ours right now, destined to diverge in a hundred years or a thousand years or a thousand years in the past. And there's no guarantee that we have doppelgangers on every single world because it could have things could have changed hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, and so this idea that like every world in the multiverse is going to have or in the case of Commanders in Crisis, every member of the team is going to have some version of themselves to hunt down on our Earth is honestly because we're vain human beings and want to think that we really matter. Uh, but it doesn't really stand up to story logic, uh, you know, and that's something that will come into play in the book. And it's going to be heartbreaking. It's an emotional spoiler, but not a story spoiler. So that's why I'm willing to get into it as an example. Like these people might want to find their counterparts on this Earth or their family. But you know what? Maybe their family... Their family line died out centuries ago, you know, like there's, there's no guarantee. Uh, and obviously there's no guarantee that even someone who looks like the person uh, who looks like someone they might've known on the old world is, is, is even remotely the same person, uh, you know? So uh, it's, it's, it's a thing we do uh, because of our perceptions. But when I looked at how the multiverse would work, I just sort of realized that it, we only thought that way because again, we have human perceptions. And to, uh, as a segue, I'll tell you, I learned to the extent that I'm able to accomplish it. I learned to think that way on Martian Manhunter because the challenge was stop thinking about things like a human. And obviously we are humans with human brains, but what Riley and I always set out to do on that book when we were building it. And also Darren as well, the letterer, uh, was like, are we doing this when we're building Martian society because it makes sense to them? Or are we doing it because it's familiar to us, humans with human brains, thinking about human shit? And that was always the sort of like rubric we had to put things to because obviously we are confined by the fact that we are people. But the challenge is to try to at least think about things differently. So we're trying to apply that thought to things in Commanders of Crisis as well and at least give you a, I don't want to say smarter because it's all bullshit fiction, not bullshit, but it's all like wild fiction any, and anything and everything is right and wrong. But we want to give you a different take, at least, if you haven't seen before. Um, you know, there's no right way to do made up superhero stories. Um, but there certainly should be a new and different way. And I think that's what folks deserve. Uh, and, and, and as I had said, that is something we started with Martian Manhunter. We really wanted to give you something totally different with the character. And again, we tried to write that basically as a science fiction book that happened to star John Jones. Well, I have, to, I have to say like, as, as soon as the premise for Martian Manhunter was announced, like you, you're, you're, you were courting a little bit of, I don't want to say animosity, but maybe pushback from some of the old comics crowd, whatever, by having him be a corrupt cop on Mars. 
Uh, I think that's also the fault. It works. <laughs> I think that's also <laughs> the fault of solicits, you know, like, because yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's always going to be people, but for the most part, people saw the types of choices he was making and the reasons he was making them. Mm -hmm. uh, they saw that it was a journey to being the character they knew and loved. Yeah. Now he was throwing babies into a thresher or something. Exactly. Um, but, you know, marketing, I mean, the story of my career has been marketing like, having you know the, the 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 window period between a solicitor when a book comes out my first book midnighter like got dan i owe dan honestly huge portions of my career and he's a gem in my area he has been to me but when midnighter came out he gives his interview and it's like oh he's gonna be on dating apps gonna be on dating apps and like and it, like for three months four months everybody's like oh mid steve's turning midnighter into a trash bag hoe and i'm just like you have no idea and it was one panel you know, uh, but but you never know until it comes out. So that's also why, by the way, I never get angry. Uh, I mean, if I mean, if you don't like something when it comes out, that's your right. But I'm just glad people are talking about shit in the time before it <laughs> actually comes out and after it's solicited. So, yeah, people were thinking, I think that I was just going to make them full on like Ray Liotta of Mars. <laughs> but, but not at all. Not at all. It's it's more a reflection of. <laughs> the struggles of the middle class, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. On a different planet. Oh, I, I think it worked beautifully. Um, That's you good. And, and, ready and for the Riley and, and uh, Ivan just clicked. Well, get, ready, get ready for the revelations involved in my in my first work at Marvel then, because I'm sure some other people are going to have opinions once that's announced as well. But... Uh, ah. <laughs> But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, we were very lucky uh, on Martian Manhunter. And of the books I did at DC, like there are many, many, many I'm very proud of, but the true, truest collaboration I had was Martian Manhunter. And there's a reason, you know, in the collected edition, I don't just, a lot of times you have interviews with the colorist and the letterer. I mean, obviously the writer and the line artist, but it was important to me to include Darren and Ivan, but it was also important for me to include Chris Conroy uh, and Dave Wilgos, who edited that book, because they're just as much a part of that book being exactly what it is as anyone else. They're in the office, in the trenches, every day, fighting for something to be the way it should be and helping us make the best version of what we want to do. So everyone stepped up their game in that book, and I'm super, super proud of it. And like, we gave each other the room to do our jobs. You know, for example, like, I, I always think like, when the book started, all the telepathy was just going to be a different balloon. And it was Darren that was like, you know what? It should be coming from the center of their heads because they're speaking with their minds, not their mouths. And that was a thing of like Riley and I were still in human mode when sounds come out of our mouths. Um, a lot in my case, because I'm from New York. And uh, and we just didn't even cross our mind. And, and yet that to me was such a genius small note. And that's because we weren't just like, letterer, you work for us, shut the fuck up. But we were just like, no, like you have a great idea and, and we're gonna, and, and we respect your your work and your ideas and your creativity. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I kinda wanna, yeah, if I can just change gears a little bit, but in that same vein of respecting creativity uh, with the pool, we haven't talked too much about it, but the, the manga influence that you brought up I'm always excited when anybody brings up an anime or manga influence because I feel like it's we're feeling the influence a little bit more in Western comics and it's so popular. I mean, Demon Slayer sold so many copies and it's it's just huge. And I wanted to see how much of an influence you had in the creation of that by anime and manga or if that can if that kind of came purely from the. The illustrations. Well, no, I mean, I'll be honest with you, 99 percent of it came from Trina and and ricardo uh and that is largely because especially on originals that's how i work mm -hmm. you know i would never i wouldn't get into a collaboration with people i didn't think were great at their job and so it's at least not my style of writing to think that i'm also there to tell artists what to do uh in anything more than to help them work through the like present the story but they don't work for me uh and and colorists and letterers don't work for me so uh, to me, like when we decided Ricardo was going to come in the book, like my job is to give him space to do his best fucking job and not lean in and be like, well, this is the, like, you know, this is my vision. Go fuck yourself. Like, to be honest. So, uh, and, and look, there's a lot of people that disagree with me and they're, I'm sure. And they're allowed. Like, I'm not, you're only here to get my opinion, but like, especially on originals, 
Like, why get into it with someone if you didn't think that they were incredible at their job and you didn't want to help them be the best possible? So I did not have a lot of, of direct influence on the, on the manga style, other than I knew Ricardo was going to deliver and I knew how to give him big set pieces where he could and then get out of the way uh, and let him and Trina do their thing. Awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, really. Uh, somewhere, I, some, somewhere, somewhere, someone is like, "Oh, Steve is shit talking other writers." Well, not really, <laughs> like, because because you know what? Like, to be frank, like, I've had I've I've worked with folks who don't who almost feel trapped by that freedom. Like, I work with artists who would just want to know, and it's usually older school guys, but they just want to know what's in the panel, how many panels in the page, and all that stuff, and that's totally fine too. So, I'm only really talking about how it works best for me. Uh, you know, if I should talk someone, it'll just be Frank Barbaria, but that's because he used to live with me. So <laughs> poor Frank. No. Oh, poor Frank. Frank works in Joe Mad's video game studio. He's oh, doing- well then <laughs> he plays video games all day. Yeah, if you play Darksiders, that's he's the writer of that now. Oh wow. That's awesome. That is awesome. Uh Mike. Yeah, Steve, we've got time just for uh, one quick one. I, hopefully it'll be quick. But um, dealing with characters like Midnighter and Prizefighter, um, how do you feel about your position being a creative comic uh, voice for the LGBTQ plus community and bringing more representation, more characters to the I'm literally trying so to, to like fix my hair to not look like a fucking toucan, but I don't know how to move my hand in relation to what I see in the screen. Sorry, I'm gonna answer your question too, but it's so, in, like, as a queer American, this is actually a <laughs> that I can't fix my hair. So it's really- Stream yard strikes again. Uh, <laughs> you look fine. Don't I know, it's like yeah, the thing going on good. Twitter, like, like hey, everything something is anti-gay that really isn't, uh, stream yard. <laughs> stream yard. <laughs> what a great answer. Um, but anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, this has been bothering me for an hour. I'm like, fuck, I looked good in my normal human perception. But anyway, um, look, I think my job is to tell things that are true to me and, and present well-rounded, richly layered characters and, and then uh, pay it forward. Uh, and, and that's why on Commanders in Crisis now and in the future, you're going to see not just new, like, I mean, we have classic, iconic cover artists coming on, for example, but we also have up and coming marginalized cover artists. You know, we featured Micah Sozo, who's a who's a black female creator. We featured David Tulaski, uh, his first ever comic cover work. And that stuff like that is gonna continue uh, because there's perspectives that are not mine, obviously, and every single one of those is just as valuable. The reality is like, I'm not an authority and it's dangerous for people to think I am uh, it's especially dangerous for me to think I am because I only have one experience, my own. So, and to try to do something else is just not going to read as true. So, you know, for better or worse, my the way I write uh, and deal with queer subject matter is different than the way Cena does. It's different than the way that uh, Tynan does. It's, you know, different than the way than any other queer, where I'm talking about queer male creators in this case, but any other queer creator does. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. So the, the, my job, I think is to talk about things that are true and real and do it as often as possible, you know, Mm -hmm. but make sure that they're actually real characters and not caricatures. That's what I've tried to do from the beginning. And then, as I said, make room either, you know, for other people help boost up other people and raise different voices because yeah, you're going to get a different book from me than you would from someone like Vita, uh, or Teeny Howard, uh, since I, felt like a jackass for only saying male queer creators, Um, you know, like, and that's good. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I shouldn't try to be them and they shouldn't try to be me because all that's just, all you get is like 50% bullshit in that case. So, you know, that's sort of how I feel like what I, there was a time like when men came out, I, I always get this question to be honest, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but it was like, you know, Midnighter is not going to be everyone's story. And if you try to be, it's just going to be vanilla and it's going to end up appealing to no one because you're trying to give something to everyone. Right. So the job is to do what, like a well-rounded, uh, 
character and, and, and bit of representation and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again. I was at a panel with Greg Pak uh, a couple of years ago and he said that it's not just about diversity, it's about a diversity of diversity. And that means that we can't just have one character that somehow is everything to everyone in a marginalized community. Uh, we just have to keep, and also like when we do that, we, we show people that we ourselves are not caricatures. And that's the other reason that it's important. You know, um, I do a lot of queer work and jokes about myself aside, it's not all I do, but also I try to write, never write two characters that are always the same. Um, and I try to examine things from different perspectives. Uh, sometimes I think that that makes books overlooked, you know, because it's harder, you know, a book like Crude, like I could have done it from the perspective of the queer character, but I was interested in examining my own relationship with father, my literal father and father figures. Uh, and so I wanted to examine that from a father's perspective after he loses his queer son. And sure, like, I think that if I, it maybe would have been, it would have been a different book and gotten more attention had I just focused on this bisexual lead. But I personally didn't think that's what the story deserves. So I did what was true to me. Um, and that's what I, you know, I, I, I try to keep doing that. But, but at the end of the day, like, just make things real to me. That's my only, that's my only North star. And of course that's sometimes ridiculous in the world of superheroes, but the emotions and the characterization, those things should always be real. Even if they're fucking flirting around the multiverse and all these things, like they still have to be real characters. Otherwise you don't know why to care. Yeah. yeah. And that's a problem for me as well. I would say that I've had to learn since starting writing uh, because I myself, I'm probably a sociopath and always identify with the least human characters. You know, I mean, you know how long it was till I realized that Gandalf wasn't the main character of Lord of the Rings? Long. <laughs> long. <laughs> you know, do you know how long it was where I realized it wasn't normal to identify most with Dr. Manhattan and the Watchmen? Long time. <laughs> long fucking time. So, like... You know, I had to readjust to be like, oh, people want characters that have human emotions and not the problems of deities that you will never be. Yeah. Um, so, but I have. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes you have the problems of Alligator Man and uh, running around in Gotham City. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> or Crocodile I, well, Man, I should say. I was going to say Alligator Man, that is New York, but. Uh, you know, uh, but but I try, I, you know, I, I have, and that's a benefit I had at DC, honestly. Uh, and so I, I should, you know, we talked a lot about the, the constraints, but also the benefits of working at the big two. But also, like, if there's anything I learned in four years, it's how to talk to a mainstream audience. And I actually think that that's incredibly valuable because... You know, a book like Undertow that I did, I'm very happy with, but I probably would do it, I mean, like anything, I would do it a different way now, six years later. Uh, because I've learned how to effectively get the ideas in my head, my lightly sociopathic, sarcastic, weird head, uh, into people's more, uh, more sane, more normal heads. And, and I learned that at DC, like the way to say things, if I learned anything there, the way to say things through story, I learned there. And it's incredibly valuable. You're probably getting, not probably, you are getting better work than you ever would have if I didn't go through all, all the hoops we talk about and every creator likes to talk about, if I didn't jump through them, you wouldn't be getting the stuff you do now. And I think that's incredibly valuable. Definitely. And uh, I mean, just to, we're, we're uh, past our hour, but uh, you know, just, just to end it on a, a good positive note, based on what you said, I, you know, following yourself and staying true to who you are seems to just be the cornerstone of your career thus far and i mean really i i you know i know a steve orlando comic when i'm reading it and oh, there's penises 31 of them 31 flavors uh it's really only like anyway i'm not going to say that but at most three flavors but but um <laughs> no, you, you, you not get this content with other people on well, it got a yeah. little touch and go with Richard Starkings, but for very different reasons. <laughs> and and we won't go there, but because um, that's just, that's just going to be a cell phone. But um, 
Anyway, no, the, the books are great. The, the, the pull from TKO, Commanders in Crisis from Image. I mean, hell, you know, the unexpected was freaking awesome. Okay. It had basically the macho oh man God. running around in it. I, yeah. wish, I wish, I wish I could do more firebrand. Like if you want to talk about a Steve Orlando character, the minute I was like, she has to punch someone in the face every day. I'm like, this is just me. I want it to be me. It's how I feel every day. Yeah. Um, what a I'm little not- hidden gem of a book that nobody was talking about, unfortunately. Well, that but- was before I moved to Boston too. Now it's even worse. People ah. that want to walk in the sidewalks, five abreast, horse shit. <laughs> that's awesome dude well hey thank you so much for stopping in steve we really appreciate it thank you for your time thank you for really really would, uh, crisis. Yeah. continued luck in that regard and uh man i i feel like maybe about the point we get to issue 12 we should come back together recap the whole thing see how see how we all feel about it I would have to come back. I'd love to come and talk to you guys. You know, I, I would, uh, I've been talking about it for three years that in my mind and that you guys know a year, but, uh, my book, uh, kill man, uh, for folks that have been reading like things like Virgil, things like midnighter it's out in early December. I just sent that bitch to print. It has been a, uh, a struggle in the best possible way, but it's finally out the door. Uh, and it's, I think the best thing I've ever done. So what I'd love to do, I mean, we'll gladly talk to you about Commanders of Crisis, but you guys are on my review list. I think you're going to get a copy of Kill a Man. uh, And and I would love to have, I'd love to come on and talk to you guys about it. Anytime you want, dude. Absolutely. Presumably with Phil Kennedy Johnson, my co-writer, because it's impossible to get that guy to crack a smile. I've been trying for three years. Oh, we can make that happen. You think so? But he's him. in the military, yeah. like a fucking palace guard in England. Like you can't get it. <laughs> Mike, uh, you're on this one. You're our resident veteran. You speak the language. I, I mean, Phil. Phil, joking aside, Phil is great. We'd love to come on and talk. But uh, I'm excited to show you guys that book. If anyone watching, yeah. like, I've been running my mouth about it for over a year on Twitter, and we're finally coming out. Uh, you know, we were supposed to be out for Pride Month, but that didn't happen. We were supposed to be out for Coming Out Month, but that didn't happen, but much like a drag queen, we're showing up super late, but you're gonna be happy once we go on stage. So that's my final comment on that. What a perfect way to end it. Thank you, Steve Orlando, for showing up, showing out, and writing awesome comics. This has been episode 105 of the Comic Watchers Show. Until next time, support your local comic store and be good to each other. Till next time.